Hello and welcome to Who Are You? This is the Babylon 5 Watchcast, hosted by two former strangers, now friends, who are re-watching a favorite show from their childhood, the aforementioned Babylon 5. I'm Jafer. And I'm Laura. And I am Ben. And Ben's, Ben's with back. us today. Yay! Yay! And Sorry. He's gonna... <laughs> Don't apologize. No. <laughs> Don't apologize for your presence, Ben. We appreciate you here. Always. Some more than others. Well, I'm not trying to replace you this time, so. L- Laura appreciates you more than I do. I know. Um, <laughs> but today, we get to, Ben, you get to ask us the one. What is the one? All right. Yes. So now I get to uh, to have the power. So I'm going to start off. I'm going to start off easy. Okay. What is your one condiment? You have one thing to put on on your food for the rest of your life. Everything is else is out. Mm. No more sauces. No more dressings. You get one. Question: Can we count guacamole as a condiment? Or is if it, it too if, much? If it's, if it's sauces, stuff. then it for sure counts. Ah, uh, guacamole is an interesting one. I will say we can count a guacamole because I put I put guacamole on my bratwursts. It's fantastic if you haven't tried it. Uh, wow. So okay, I'll say I will count guacamole. You're really crossing the streams there. <laughs> it's all sauces, though. Yep. So oh. like ranch could be your thing. Balsamic vinaigrette could be your thing. You know, hot sauce could be your thing. Oh God! Don't make me choose between balsamic vinegar and hot sauce, Ben. <laughs> I, I, I. Why did I hurt you? I. This is antithetical to my lifestyle. I. <laughs> you like this is targeted. <laughs> ben. Ben has been in my house numerous times. Ben has seen my fridge. My fridge. Like some people have a like little sauce area in their fridge. Both doors of my fridge. Sands one little bucket for butter and stuff are sauces. Mm -hmm. I live a sauce heavy lifestyle. I have probably 20 different hot sauces, just just hot sauces in my fridge right now. Oh, I know what you're fair, but this is this is something that it goes way before I met you. Growing up, my family always had a completely full fridge. There was never any food in it. It was all different (laughs) sauces. Interesting. So d- did you carry that forward or do you like make everybody pare down the sauces now? I think I've, I, I appreciate the variety, but I also tend, I, I mix it up between if the food is properly prepared, you shouldn't need the condiment. And mm-hmm. uh, I've got my go-tos. I've got like, you know, six different things that I'm just like, okay. I know you guys are here to party. Let's go. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah. See, my issue with this is the way you've worded this is like marinara is an option. Like, I I would say marinara is something intrinsic to like it. It it is it is a difficult. Like subject. I can still I have like Alfredo sauces and stuff on my pastas. Yeah. If I'm making a fettuccine Alfredo. Okay. Like, can you give me just a dish to work with? Maybe if we narrow the scope down, no. I'll have an easier time answering. No, Jafar is the one. J- Jafar, I'm going to p- propose an idea, and okay. that is whatever one that you pick, you need to make sure that it will be good with French fries. Because okay. otherwise you have dry French fries all the time for the rest of your life. And and some French fries that might be okay, but some French fries you might be like, man, I really wish I had something, you know? I, I mean, I love ketchup and fries, but the part about ketchup and fries that I love is the vinegar in ketchup. Mm-hmm. And so I think if I had to stick to one, it would probably be a vinegar. I'd probably go with a red wine or balsamic, maybe a malt vinegar. Because that's got enough versatility where I could do, put it on a lot of things and get a bit of tang, you know, like, you know, get a bit of that vinegary flavor that I like. Um, if I'm trying to pick something to just maximize my options, I would probably go with like, sour cream because you can throw sour cream on anything and it makes it better mm, i do love me some sour cream yeah yeah uh, o- almost anything at least if as long as you're you don't apply too much or too uh-huh. little and mm. it's and you apply it at the right time because if you're making something else if it like was going to mix with stuff or something like and you know 
I, I hate this question. So I'm just going to say <laughs> if I if I had to put one thing on my French fries for the rest of my life, I'd probably pick malt vinegar. So okay. so does my does my uh, cold open get a fuck this episode? <laughs> <laughs> just you, Ben. Fuck this cold you get open. A fuck this episode. <laughs> fuck this cold open. OK, for those of you keeping track at home. All right. What about for you? Laura? Well, if you're going to let me have guacamole, I'm doing guacamole. That's my thing. I love me some avocado. I think it's good on French fries. I've already done that. Already been there. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to rock. Okay. All right. What well, else? You hit us again. Well, Ben gets to answer too. Oh, he gets to answer too. I'm sorry. Okay. Give us your uh, answer, Ben. You adding fries in there? I'm just like, oh man, is anybody going to go and pick fry sauce? That wonderful meld of two two sauces. But I would probably go with a stone ground mustard. Okay. Mm. Yeah, a, a nice quality mustard is you can't go wrong with a lot of stuff. Yeah, even fries. Yeah. Yeah. All right. OK, hit us again. Second one. What is your one youthful fad you regret? Let's get introspective oh. here. <laughs> oh, no. If you guys need one a minute of my to neck think, regrets. <laughs> I, can, I can go first. Give you guys a, a minute to, 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 to think about all those all those horrible, you know, middle school fashion choices. Because that's where mine went. I was a zip-off pants kid. Where, oh, you know, you those. had the pants, you zip them off, and they become shorts. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I got, like, one pair because I thought they were cool. And then somehow that became, like, a thing that mom and aunts and stuff knew about. Mm -hmm. And so I yep. ended up with, like, four pairs of zip-off pants. Let me tell you. Not as great as just either or and the second you like you know eat crap you know biking or on a skateboard or something your knees are now ground hamburger um yeah. and i was i was not a dexterous kid and so i destroyed my legs i had a, i don't know if i because we've had this conversation about your your zip off pants in the oh past, yeah i had right? zip off pants and zip off sleeves on some jackets yeah. i was full zip off <laughs> yeah you're a zip off kid uh you're I had, ready for all kinds of weather yeah yeah <laughs> so prepared a bend um, for all seasons <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are your regrets, Jafar? I'm still thinking about mine. I don't know. We'll say DDR because I look like a giant old nerd. <laughs> <laughs> DDR is a great one. <laughs> See, I didn't even try that one because I could not make it happen. <laughs> oh, I went to tournaments. I was into DDR. <laughs> <laughs> Neat. Got to get you in a vintage arcade sometime. Oh, and I know people who can, like, people make their own custom DDR things. And now I want to see Jafar do DDR to the five different theme songs. Mm. <laughs> yes. They're not, they're not good DDR songs. They're too low BPM. Oh, I know. Oh, okay. Gotcha. But you're old now. <laughs> That's fair. I have played DDR in the last two years. Like, just very briefly. Nice. Um, and I'm not inept at it. <laughs> did, did it leave you winded? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, same, same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess if I have to choose something and I don't have all day to ruminate on what a weirdo I was <laughs> when I was younger and still am, but I care less now. Um, I think one of the hard things about growing up in rural Oklahoma in the 90s and having like a handful of salons you could go to for haircuts was that, you know, you, you all have seen, you're looking at me now, that my hair is a certain texture and of copious volume. And, you know, listeners, the cartoon that we have, you know, that, that curly hair is pretty accurate on our podcast artwork. You don't get a lot of good haircuts in rural Oklahoma in the 90s from those salons. <laughs> <laughs> and you know they would try to do the latest trend on my hair and just be like oh well we'll just we'll you know we'll cut it wet and we'll cut it in this way and we'll have a lot of pictures of me as a younger person that I am okay with looking at because of my hair most of the time <laughs> <laughs> 
So I'm glad to be in a time where we can all do what's best for our natural hair and just take care of it and have it as it is. So happy I'm, to be in this time. I'm very happy as well. My, mo- my mom was somebody who every haircut I got between about age five and age 15, she was like, how about we just cut it and then you just slick it, you know, gel it straight back. And I'm just like, I don't want to look like an 80s, you know, Wall Street guy, mom. Awesome. Awesome to the max. Like, <laughs> that was out of date before I was born. <laughs> All right. We've got one last one. Okay. And I'm going to ask you guys, what is your one view? The one place you're just, you know, if you had, if you just had to have like one picture of something like this place you have been that, that vista you saw that is your one ultimate view what is it so so not barbara walters <laughs> no not barbara no walters. we we know Although your the political view from up views, there sir. is 2020 <laughs> double pond so my answer is going to be a specific drive north in michigan which is 131 north between cadillac and calcasca does that count it that can you yeah yeah it's hilly it's lots of forests it's like come up on a big hill can't see anything get to the top of the hill see forest for miles um it's gorgeous view one of my favorite drives there's a, a couple of little bodies of water you can see along the way too um it's just it's one of my all-time favorites regardless of the season it is particularly breathtaking in the fall when we have the fall colors up here and all the trees are changing And you just get miles of your oranges and your yellows and your reds. It's it's breathtaking. Mm, That's real nice. Yeah, if I have to pick one, when we were in our 20s, Aaron was working for the Forest Service, the National Forest Service. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in eastern Arizona. In this one of these forests that had had, you know, the wildfires come through. And they'd uncovered a lot of archaeological sites when they burned up some of the foliage. And so he was working just like driving out into the forest. And then they'd walk for miles and map these new sites that have been uncovered. Mm -hmm. And I went out to visit him. And he just took me out into the forest. And we just walked and and hiked for a while. And it was so cool because I, you know, I didn't know anything about Arizona and that there was this I think it's juniper forest is what they call it. And we hiked up this one hill and, you know, it had that sort of Southwest red rocks, but covered in forest. And we saw a rainbow up there and I don't know, it's just really beautiful. And I would do that again any day. Awesome. What about you? Well, I have been fortunate because I know this is not a thing everybody gets to do, but man, if you have ever had the chance to be on a boat in the ocean beyond land. Mm -hmm. It is just such a cool, just looking around and seeing no land. I love it. I, I have a feeling it's the kind of sort of thing you get when you're in space and you just look around and it's just like, man, there's nobody out here. And Mm -hmm. You know, after a while, maybe you can get scared of that. I don't know. Some people, maybe it's not your thing. For me, I loved it. I loved, like, the just the freedom of it. And just, you know, it's not flat. It's not that there's nothing. There's waves rolling. There's stuff to see. But it's not any of the stuff you are used to. And I I absolutely loved it. Yeah. That's nice. I like that. So one day when the the feds come calling and you find out Ben is taken to the sea, you know why. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we, we've discussed those views. And today's episode gives us another view. We've got season five, episode four, a view from the gallery. Nailed it. Nailed that job, segue. Jay. We open on an attack in hyperspace which in turn leads us to the station. A hostile force is looking for passive targets. The game warned everyone. And uh, we see fighters launch as the conversation moves to our focus for the episode, 
Bo and Mac. I did appreciate that. I, I, I love whenever writers do writer stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from all of my quibbles the last time I was on, I appreciated that they were like, you know, Hey, so much stuff has happened over the last two weeks. It's like, yeah, it's because it's been two weeks, two episodes. Like, you, were, this is happening in real time. So when Bo and Mac are just like, man, I don't know, something happens like every week around here. Why would we get bent out of shape about it <laughs> every week, <laughs> like clockwork? <laughs> so strange. This is the third one this month. Oh my god! If this was the third episode that aired in the month that this came out, that would be so super sweet. <laughs> I will check very quickly. <laughs> it was not. These guys really make me feel, uh, think of uh, Jerry, the janitor from Community. After mm -hmm. the paintball episode mm -hmm. where he's just like cleaning up the, the school <laughs> and just like, yeah, you guys have these adventures and somebody has to like clean all of the dead warrior cast Mimbari out of this hallway, <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, yeah. so Ben, when you saw these guys, did you get real excited? I mean, yeah, but but why? Well, well in particular, one of these guys is in your favorite movie. <gasps> Tell us more. Well, Ben, what's your favorite movie? I want to make sure I got that right because I'm pretty sure I've got it right, but I might not have it right. Do you want me to say my guess and then you can tell me if I'm good, close enough? Yeah. The Rock? Oh, I do love The Rock. Right. The Rock is a it's not my favorite movie but I do love that movie. Who's which one of these Oh, yes. Yes, Mac yeah. is the uh the Park tour Ranger. guide. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yeah, Mac is the tour guide in The Rock. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm glad I could connect those dots for you if nothing else. <laughs> yeah, no, that was awesome. Well, we are are right here at the very beginning. I did notice this is one of those few episodes not written by JMS. It is, though. Okay. Um, so he wrote this whole episode in one night. He, he said he wrote it from like 8 p.m. to 3 a.m. He got the episode done. Just like a stint. He just sat down and just this episode flowed through him. But Harlan Ellison does get a writing credit on it. Because the initial concept of the, hey, why don't we do an episode from the eyes of two maintenance workers was from Harlan Ellison. Okay. So he didn't write a word of it, <laughs> but he did come up with the initial concept. Then why didn't wow. he get a story by credit? I don't know. I think, Writing... he, I think his credit was a story by and not a written by. I but thought also, it said written by. I would, not, I would not begrudge JMS for giving Harlan Ellison a writing credit on an episode just to help out his boy Harlan Ellison. Well, <laughs> and I'm sure he needed it because I have a question for you guys because I just maybe look it up. Who had more marriages? Harlan Ellison or uh, Sheridan? Oh, okay. Harlan so Sheridan Ellison. is 3. Right. So, yeah, we'll go with Harlan. Harlan Ellison has more marriages, yeah. <laughs> Dude, so, what's the total? 5. Wow. Good for him. He convinced not quite, five not quite women. Larry King, but <laughs> interesting. Harlan Ellison was just all over YouTube. If either of you watched the most recent H Bomber Guy video, it opens nope. with an anecdote about Harlan Ellison suing for plagiarism. The guy did love suing people almost as much as he loved getting married. <laughs> <laughs> he just loves love, Ben. There's nothing wrong with that. I find it absolutely astounding that you could fall in love with that many people to the point of marriage in a lifetime. That's awesome. I'm so happy for him and so sad at the same time that all those things fell apart. I have conflicting feelings the more I think about it. Let's move on. So <laughs> Harlan Ellison and conflicting feelings go together like French fries and vinegar. <laughs> uh, JMS is getting a bunch of his stuff published here real soon, too. And also, JMS is about to release a sci-fi novel called The Glass Box. Oh, hey. So, yeah, check those things out. And also, he's writing Captain America right now, and it's awesome. Anyways, after credits, we get the same trick again. This time, Lockley and Sheridan are west-winging. When it cuts over to Bowen Mac again, 
talking about Sheridan from the perspective of a blue collar worker on the station. They bring up the incident from season three's ceremonies of light and dark. But didn't he die? <laughs> yeah. But didn't he die? I heard he died once. Was the... Yeah. Great. Love mm-hmm. it. And they talk about how much you can see that Sheridan and Delenn are truly in love with each other, which is nice. That's that's yeah. nice. I don't I don't have anything else to say about that, but it is nice. We, they have a device and they have no idea what this thing does. They're just supposed to carry yeah. it around. Maybe it repairs micro fractures in the floor or something. And since Ben is here, Ben, my co-host on Last Time On, Are right now currently with, with Victor. Yeah, we're about to get weird with it, Ben. <laughs> we have a bit on there, if you have not listened to Last Time On, where we get weird with it, where all the hosts have to come up with the most off-the-wall explanation for what a thing is or does or was in the plot of an episode. Just right off the cuff. So I've given my co-host no warning that I was going to do this. And I myself have made no notes about it, hoping that I would forget until I got to this moment of explanation, which I have. Let's get weird with it. Oh, boy. Okay. Well, Laura, since uh, this is a new game for you, I'll, I'll give you a minute to, to think. So yeah, I've got you my see the look on my face. Like, yeah. oh, no, <laughs> I, I, I came up with something pretty quick. So we've got Babylon 5. Yeah, it is a station set up for a meeting of the League of Non-Aligned Worlds. Yeah. And as such, there's probably a lot of conflicting stuff that happened before everybody agreed to sign on. Mm-hmm. And what I believe is at some point, some entrepreneurial uh, uh, game, game, sold a useless trinket, like a device that does not work, to the Pakmara. And they love this thing. It doesn't do anything, but they use it on all their ships and they demanded it be used by Babylon 5 maintenance before they were allowed on. So it is, you know, an infomercial level, like, this will repair your ship and you'll never have to worry about maintenance fees. Like, I'm game Ron Popeil. (laughs) And the Pakmara made everybody use it. And because everybody else is like, but this doesn't work. So we don't have to train our guys on how to use it. And so that is why they have to wave the stick around. Okay. I'm going to say that these are some special issue Michael Garibaldi homeschool surveillance stuff (laughs) that are designed to look for cameras or other monitoring devices. And they just wave it around. And when it finds something, it doesn't tell the workers but security oh. gets a little notification if it were to ever find something to send someone out. Okay, so it just kind of drops a drops that little GPS flag. Yeah. 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 And then Very they wake nice. up Blue Welch and he's just like, oh man. <laughs> Not another one. Ugh. I think it's pest control. I think it's putting down a little bit of like a layer of something that's okay. trying to keep those Madagascar hissing cockroaches away. But you don't need to, like, tell your people. Just be like, wave the stick. Yep. And uh, hopefully we'll get some of those Madagascar cockroaches out of here. (laughs) So after this, they go to lunch and talk spoo, which does not taste like chicken. Also, they reveal that Bo has a salami sandwich. And Mac is like, how'd you get salami up here? And my thought was like, that would be the easiest meat to get yeah it's like a cured meat yeah it famously travels (laughs) like if you tell me oh man how'd you get like you know burnt ends up here i'd be like okay yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah right but salami (laughs) is the most travelable of meats (laughs) it's intended well speaking of like meat continuity problems um spoo is not a sandwich food right i don't think so I feel like spoo does not it's it's spoo on wheat bread very clearly. Yeah. I feel like spoo is not a wheat bread food. It's it's just like weird tofu, right? Like it's got That's be. what it looks like. Yeah. I thought of but it as it, like it just does feel like I, I've learned about three alien foods and but not how to cook or prepare or serve them. And it's just like Yeah. Why why are you making a sandwich with spoo and flarn? 
Yeah. yeah. He's like a guy who puts guacamole on his bratwurst. <laughs> Zing. Yeah, he's Sorry, actually. I could, is... I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I think Ben's onto something, though. This is like raw spoo on wheat bread. It's not even cooked uh-huh. or flavored or anything. Like, yeah. He's just yeah. eating it the entirely wrong way. The banter between these two is excellent. Oh, yeah. Um, there were some Usenet notes about the two actors really liking the roles and just like they were hanging out all the time outside of filming to just like get their banter down perfect. And it shows. Yeah, it paid off. Yeah, really, really. It's worked. nice when your actors actually like each other. Yeah. Or at least can make it look like they like each other. Um, there is also a bit on the Usenets about how much of their banter is JMS and Harlan Ellison. And he, Joe had noted that is it, it would have been Mac is uh, loosely based on Harlan, but he denied any connection between himself and Bo. Now uh, I wonder how tall Harlan Ellison is, because Mac is not a tall actor, it seems. Well, he's about as tall as Walter Koenig, as we see, because we get a scene with the two of them together, right? He's a little bit taller than Walter. Walter is a short man, having stood next to him in the last month and a half. Yeah. Well, presumably he's done some getting shorter since Babylon. Yeah, yeah. I'm He probably didn't start super tall. (laughs) Yeah. Over in MedLab, Bo is fixing some computers when he asks Franklin why he cares about saving the aliens that are attacking them. And Franklin takes this opportunity to go on this whole thing where he says he's not even sure. And there are like so many reasons to keep someone who's attacking you alive. Like, yeah. Uh, like, okay. Off the bat, just like, just say military intelligence, you know? Like, yeah. But then you don't get to lecture a guy for five minutes about your and that's that's what Frank was really getting out of this. <laughs> yeah, he wants he wants to give a lecture about his dad being a POW and getting treated by a doctor even and then the doctor paying for it with his life but he got his dad and but so righteous. So righteous. So... Not that Franklin's not wrong. Oh no. No. Like he, all he had to say was like man I believe ev- all life is sacred and done. I if I got shot somewhere I'd want their doctor to fix me. And <laughs> we want to be able to exchange prisoners of war with those guys in case they capture any of ours. Done. We want to know how they work biologically in case that's important. Done. Maybe their blood is just really cool. <laughs> yeah. Do they have the cure for cancer in their blood? That'd be fun to know. Yeah, right? Who knows? Yeah, let's forget the machine we have downstairs that cures all disease. Shh, Maybe we bitch. find it in their blood. <laughs> <laughs> Mac heads up to CNC where he's working on repairing the backup targeting sensors, the secondary systems. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I've seen enough bridge explosions to be really worried about our guy here. <laughs> he's yeah, like that's crawling in a console, console that looks wired with fireworks. Does not want to be there. Yeah. The the one thing that this scene made me realize that kind of bummed me out is this does, you know, of course, bring uh, thoughts of the TNG episode Lower Decks. Yeah, of course. But the one thing Lower Decks did was it made Nurse Ogawa one of our main characters. And it made me just, like, I appreciated Corwin pops up a lot in this. I'm just like, why didn't you just give us a Corwin episode? A day in the life. A Corwin episode. Yeah. That would have been nice. Still love Mac and Bo, though. Yep. Yeah. While he's on there, the scout patrol comes through, and uh, our guy ends up saving the day by removing a cockroach and repairing some wiring at the last second, which lets them target farther than normal and kill the last scout. Yeah. And no one, like, applauds our guy. That's the thing. Like, it's clear that he is the one who saved saved your bacon. Yeah. And yet... He's not even noticed. Not nope. even a thank you. No, it's Lockley's just now, I want to talk to Garibaldi. And it's like, why? <laughs> don't, yeah, I mean, I mean it makes sense in a minute. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm always happy for somebody to yell at Garibaldi, but it's also just like, if if my base gets attacked, am I going to yell at the head of the CIA? 
I mean, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you can. It's an option. Clearly. Bo and Mac talk about Lockley, reminding us that we don't know her Civil War history. Hmm. Uh, additionally, they bring up Ivanova leaving. Yeah. Does so, this feel a little bit like we look directly at the camera and talk to the internet for a moment? And, and Mac says... When Ivanova left, everyone had an opinion. Maybe she left for more money. So was like, mm. there was Joe caught a lot of flack for this one. And on Usenets, he reaffirmed that it was the last lines of that were the takeaway and not the how, the how you got there. Uh, there will always be rumors. Rumors will always would be bullshit because it's nobody's business but Claudia's. And this was an attempt to show his support and say that the rumors were bullshit and it was her decision to make and she made it and it doesn't matter what anyone thinks. Yeah. Is what he said afterwards. This feels not great watching. Even today, tw- you know, 20 years later, this feels not great. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I, I've read it and maybe because I have the 20 years later knowledge. As just like him saying, hey, everyone on the internet who's talking about her leaving for more money, like, you know, I I hear you. I hear you saying that. (laughs) I'm not going to acknowledge whether that's correct or not. Yeah, this definitely does feel like it's uh, turned a hard cam and break the fourth wall. Yeah. Doing the episode at the internet. So we get uh, Lockley dressing down Garibaldi with a dramatically timed lift exit right after this. Yeah. I know that I've said, I don't know how I feel about Lockley. I really like her in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it, she does have that great point. Like, why did we make a beat cop the head of the CIA? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like different skill sets, right? Right. Yeah. Like did, did grandma's homeschool security class even go over like intelligence network? Yeah, outside of beating up somebody for information. Hey, Jafar, you know, when he's in his office, it's by the book. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Down in Brown 7, Bo and Mac repair a leaky pipe while talking jump gate logistics. Uh And this also feels like a giant just at me next time to the use nets. It sure does, doesn't it? Yeah. (laughs) Like, oh, well, they were complaining about why you just don't shut the jump gate down to stop the bad guys from getting through on the internet. Well, I got an answer for that, smart ass. <laughs> but it also feels like we never find out who these bad guys are. Yeah. But we know they are right. strong enough to almost destroy Babylon 5. Have the, have the sh- jump gate shut down for a week. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah, it seems like I maybe I close the drawbridge just... for a week and I don't die. <laughs> Yeah, that also it does make me think of something because they're talking about how they're looking for easy pickings. And I know the white stars are away, but with all of the stuff that has happened over the last like year in the galaxy, wouldn't Babylon 5 be like the most secure place? It's the one place that hasn't had a civil war. <laughs> it was the the headquarters of the army's army that told the two progenitor races to get the hell out of our galaxy. Yeah. Like, this is not where I'd be like, Ooh, easy pickings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, I've got some issues, but yeah. Centauri prime, Narn, Mimbar and earth all blew up recently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There are other options for sure. Uh, The attackers jump in and the battle begins as Bo and Mac watch from the observation lounge. They give us a little bit about the atmospheres inside the individual ships being of different compositions, which in turn ignite different colors. So you know which side a ship is on when it explodes based off of the color of the debris. Yeah, yeah. That's, I don't want to say fun. That's, it's interesting. Interesting. It's very philosophical. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like how in Star Wars, the Empire has better uh, crystals in their ships 
and that's why they have uh, green lasers, uh, and the the rebels have worse ones, and that's why they have red lasers. Oh, hey Ben, that's a Star Wars fact I didn't know. Really? Yeah, Was that? I don't know that this has happened with us before. I mean, I got one on you once, so I think we're even now. Uh, well, there's there's plenty of Star Wars trivia that neither of us know. We found that out the hard way when we went to a Star Wars trivia night. We're just like, oh, no, God, I don't know. OK, no, 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 no. No. Going into the final question, our teams were tied for first, Ben. Remember that. And we yeah. and the final question was a name two out of the three. We each had one correct that we knew and they were different ones. We both got the final question wrong and dropped down. If we had just worked together instead of getting up our own asses about <laughs> who knew more about Star Wars, we would have won that bar trivia night. Hey, check it out. Nerd fight. Okay. <laughs> oh, we got a white star coming through. Yeah. We get, when does the that white happen? star and then we get the fight scene. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the white, one of the white stars makes it back. And the station is being bombarded. Everyone retreats to shelters. They're taking an elevator to a shelter and they end up in a firefight. And we see some of the aliens in their ridiculous fucking helmets. What purpose did the Ike? I want to see one of these they aliens. Look like heads. The, they look like the Emperor's stormtroopers, right? The guys yeah. who have the red, not to bring Star Wars back up so quickly, but here we are with the red helmets. They absolutely do. Like, the thing is, is if you look at the back of the helmet, it's like normal head shape. And then the front of the helmet is very dramatically different. And do they have like a normal back of the head and then weird stuff that extrudes from the front of like, I want to see what these look like. You're one ugly motherfucker. I want to know. <laughs> it's not in the budget for this episode. But I want to no, know. No, we got helmets. Do you guys know? Do they ever anywhere in the B5 Apocrypha explain who these guys are? Or is that part of the mystique is that we just don't know? Um I could see it being the second, but I honest I do not have that knowledge. Jafar looks like he has the face of a man who is Googling. This yeah. episode. Because this could be absolutely one of those things where like, Ben, they wrote a seven part book series about this nope four of them sure, are actually pretty sure. good uh, <laughs> nope even i've been around enough sci-fi in my life even in the babylon 5 wiki they are just called scout fleet race nothing <laughs> i did so they get in this fight scene i did like we get zach allen kicking some butt and then mac kills a guy straight up mercs him <laughs> yeah and is not introspective at all he's just like <laughs> <laughs> and then later they have a conversation about those are our boys out there flying and keeping us safe and max just like i know i shot a guy today <laughs> yeah they get to like belly crawl to safety and then they land on the island of misfit telepaths yeah they get back here oh again. i forgot this was in here yeah they tell Bo and mac the other side of telepaths and death we have not heard this stuff before. The explosion of consciousness when you're not connected to a death, the mind imprints the objects around it for a short time. That's interesting. And seems yeah, like it could have cool. been a plot point in a previous episode with very little work. <laughs> yeah. No, but we need we need a reason for Byron to be creepy in this episode. Yeah. <laughs> One of the raiders runs in and the telepaths collectively turned them away. It's cool. I, I don't even know if they were telepathic. If I walked into a room and a bunch of people with 90s hair were just like, hmm. <laughs> Maybe he's like <laughs> I'm all right. I'm just a goon. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need this. You, cl you people are this clearly seems not above a my pay grade. Yeah. <laughs> Six weirdos and two janitors. Okay. <laughs> Your lives are clearly worse living here than me shooting you. I'm just going to move on. Byron does connect the mind of Bo to a pilot so he can experience his desires to be a pilot and defend the station. And then Bo and Mac make it to a shelter where Londo and Jakar are being Londo and Jakar. 
but they're being they're being season five Londo and Jakar, which I love. Yeah, yeah, they're they're buddies, they're joke buddies. Mm-hmm. I do the appreciate. Odd couple. <laughs> Londo was just like, "What have I done to the universe to deserve this?" And Jakar's just like, "Bitch, please, <laughs> my dude." The, the like, the okay. Side eye. <laughs> Oh, the side eye. I live for the Jakar side eye. What haven't you done to the universe, Londo? And then they talk about their childhoods or lack thereof. You didn't grow up. You just grew old. I feel like the last few episodes of this show have been like really trying hard, like leaning hard on the have some sympathy for Londo stick Mm -hmm. after all of the genocide. And I'm like, I mean, he was so fun before the genocide. I think we were already there. You don't have to try to make me <laughs> like. <laughs> the more you remind you know. me that I should forgive Londo, the less likely I am to forgive Londo. Yeah, yeah. It's weird, but that's kind of how I'm feeling. Yeah, remember how you did that genocide? Let's feel bad for you. Instead of just being like, let's feel bad for you. And it's just not yeah. like, I'm remembering the genocide, guys. Yeah. And, and it, Londo's, to be strange. fair, that was Reefa's fault. I mean, L- Londo's not done doing terrible shit. Like. Right. <laughs> I mean, there, I mean, there's more on the way, y'all. <laughs> Spoilies. He should just, th- that should be his, like, away message. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Londo can't come to the phone right now. He's probably doing terrible shit. <laughs> just. You message in on him on AOL and AIM just pops back. BRB doing terrible shit. Uh, the second wave of the attack comes in. The hole is breached. Uh, Bo and Matt get called to Red One to put out fires. And as they start to head over there, they run into Sheridan and Delenn. And Sheridan has them escort Delenn to the life pods. But not going himself. Like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> You've already martyred okay. yourself once. Like, you, yeah, you don't need to do it again. This makes me mad because this is the second time we hear people talking about, hey, you guys should get off the station, like get down to Epsilon, do something. And they're like, I'm not going to go. I'm going to stay. And I know we're not seeing the rest of the episode. Like, that's the whole point of this. But gosh, I wish I saw one singular example of them doing anything to help resolve this situation (laughs) you know who might be able to help there's a guy on epsilon 3 that we're friends with (laughs) that controls a really powerful piece of equipment (laughs) so maybe we should go to epsilon 3 whenever we don't know anything about the we don't know anything about these people their wants their needs their desires their abilities should we ask the guy with the the magic computer who can see everything in the galaxy nah so whenever (laughs) there is a situation like this on babylon 5 which is about every five or six episodes someone on the use nets would go hey why didn't they ask draw for help and jms like (laughs) had a copy paste answer and in every single one of these it gets it made it to the midwinter lurkers guide where it's just like I didn't want my my machine of the gods to be a deus ex machina. Just like copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. <laughs> I, I made a machine of gods and I didn't want it to be God. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, this is like every time Star Trek forgets that they, there's like seven different things running around that have God level powers. <laughs> <laughs> so Delenn tells Bo and Mac that she's going to trash the pod if they put her in one. So it's safe to assume the pod is already fucked up and don't bother. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) She goes back to John and we watch the White Star Fleet arrive from a porthole. She refers to them as worker cast, too. I think that from Delenn, it is a very endearing thing to say. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that would be so endearing to us as humans. if you don't know like you walk into a mcdonald's someone hands you a hamburger and you go worker cast <laughs> yeah it would have been nice if like one of if like mac was just like yo what the hell lady <laughs> that's offensive and bo's like no 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 they actually just put the worker cast in charge on minbar like it's cool <laughs> what? specifically her she did that yeah <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah she's pro-union 
here I have a question for you guys right. uh, because we get this wonderful speech about you know Sheridan and, and Delenn's love <laughs> and how how great their relationship is. Do you guys feel that as Babylon Five podcasters, do you feel like this is one of the great sci-fi love stories? Oh, uh, no. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I feel like the story wants me to think that. Yeah. And I think that yeah. there is a time in my life when I did think that. I don't know if I feel that way now. My 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 problem with a lot of it in the, the later seasons of Babylon 5 is they do a lot of tell, not show. Yeah. Yeah. They talk about how they have this wonderful romance and they love each other more than anybody. And it was actually something I deeply appreciated about the, the beginning of the road home mm -hmm. where it's just them being a cute married couple for three minutes. Yeah. And I'm like, this is what I wanted. I wanted to see like their actual relationship, not I have to watch you sleep for three days or you have, we have to test out, if we can have sex while all of my friends hang out in the next room, like I want to, <laughs> I want to see these characters like emotionally connecting. Yeah. I mean, I think that is just JMS has grown as a writer a lot in the last mm -hmm. 20 years. And that is something that I'd be very interested to see out of any further Babylon stuff, five stuff we may or may not get. So the battle is won. It's at a great cost. We see Franklin recording losses in space TSA. And it's like yeah. very quiet and introspective. And at one point he's just like checking for a pulse under the welcome to Babylon 5 sign. Yes. I noticed yeah. that. I put that in my notes. I'm just like, oh, you cheeky, you cheeky set designer. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah, that was yeah. that was a nice touch. I mean, from very a poetic. From a yeah po from a poetry standpoint exactly laura it was a nice touch it was very sad <laughs> did you yeah. guys know what is the logo on these blankets um i did not catch anything in particular i would assume that it is the babylon 5 shield but it wasn't it was something else at least i that i it didn't look like the babylon 5 shield to me yeah it it might not be anything in particular um I don't it didn't strike me as the emblem of like the ISA or anything. So um some leftovers. Probably, yeah. Over in CNC, Bo and Mac are fixing up stuff as Lockley and Corwin talk. Mac signs off on Lockley as further repairs are made. And Bo and Mac are recognized by Delenn as they walk down a hall. And they yeah. get they get spoo to credits, and the price of spoo has ch gone up fifty percent over the course of this episode. Yeah. Well, uh, they did just that is war profiteering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that is our episode. Do we have any final thoughts before we rate this thing? I'm I'm, I'm just glad I got it. to be on this one. I well, you yeah. asked Ben. <laughs> I did. You specifically you asked a for great this one. episode. It's a great episode. So you want to, knowing that you know you picked this one, do you want to go ahead and give us your rating? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so this, I I know it's a quibble, but I think this is my favorite episode of season five. Mm, okay. Because the finale is season four. That's right. Uh, so that way, I get to I get to have I get to have both of those. Uh, <laughs> No, I, uh, I will 100% accept that. Yeah. Uh, I I love when a show expands itself to to give us different points of view. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I love, you know, I love that they made a whole, you know, they made a whole TV show about how cool it is watching sci-fi adventures from the point of view of people on the lower decks. So I I loved following Bo and Mac around. I, 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 as much as like the giant freaking sci-fi nerd in me is just like, please explain everything about these attackers. I need to know their customs, their culture, their their political stances. I, what are what are they trying to get out of this? Please just tell me everything now so I can have every you know every minute piece of detail. 
I still appreciate just the vague, the vagueness, the like, hey, we don't know anything. I, I, I fix pipes. Somebody starts shooting torpedoes at us. I still fix pipes. Nobody tells me nothing. Um, mm-hmm. And so we have the same like disconcerting feeling of not knowing as Bo and Mac. And so I appreciate that they never went back and told us who these scout fleet people are. And so I love this episode. It is one of the ones I think about when I think about Babylon 5. For me, this is a Babylon 5 out of 5. I'm with Ben. This is a 5 out of 5 for me. I love when sci-fi remembers that not everyone in the universe is heroes or villains. And that sometimes there's just a whole bunch of little people in between. And I love it. I love it. I, I even love the we're, you know, we're writing at the internet moments. <laughs> I like it when somebody gets to like get their get their say in and they're not doing it on Twitter or something like that. They're doing it in their work. Love it. I'm a big fan. That actually took away from it a bit for me. The stuff that was clearly at the internet, um, mm. which is why I had written down four and a half out of five. Oh, okay. But I won't be the party pooper today. I do love this episode and you bring up a ton of great points. So fuck it. It's worth it. It's a five out of five. Yeah. Yeah. Triple play. Our first 15. Probably. (laughs) Statistically. (laughs) Yum yum pods over here going, you can't do that. (laughs) It's yum yum yum. You heard me. (laughs) Come at us, right? I I just want the CW to announce Babylon 15. (laughs) And it's just the logo pops up and JMS just comes out of the shadows. Some stuff has happened, (laughs) y'all. All right. Well, that's that one. Next week, we've got season five, episode five, Learning Curve. And actually, the source of my episode descriptions has changed. So, Oh, okay. Well, the Blu-rays are out now. You can go buy the series on Blu-ray Remastered. Oh, that's true. Mm -hmm. And so I've got a new source for... I didn't check to see if it was the same as Voodoo or iTunes or whatever, but... uh, iTunes had a big spoiler in it, so... Oh, this does not, really. Okay, tell me what this one says. Four rangers from Mimbar come with a status report for Delenn, while a down-below racketeer decides it's time to get rid of Zack. Wow. Okay, that's very different than the iTunes. Yeah, what's the iTunes say? Oh, I don't have it up. I, I... Delenn receives a status report from the rangers on Mimbar. A ranger in training visits Babylon 5 and fights a powerful criminal. Lockley has some surprising secrets in her past, including the fact that she fought with the side of the corrupt Earth government against Sheridan in the recent war. Well, yeah, that duh. was the spoiler I was talking about. <laughs> I mean, come on. Like, they've been playing coy with it for three episodes, but it's like, yeah, I think we would know if she was on the good guy side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It does seem like the, the lady doth protest too much. We keep bringing it up. Yeah. Well, and it's also like it would be kind of like, Sheridan, don't you do you not know who was working for you? He's like, I don't know, man. I had a bunch of ships. This wasn't actually that big of a threat. We outnumbered Earth government by a lot. <laughs> I mean, by the end, maybe you wouldn't be sure, but I feel like the first handful you definitely I mean, we saw those captains choose, you know, it was a whole thing. Yeah. For yeah. a couple episodes there. But yeah, I agree. It, it's it's been pretty obvious the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't show up just like Okay, I know I'm here replacing Ivanova, and she made me poop myself as I was defending the last bit of Earth when she called herself the God of Death. And so now I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, that's that, everyone. So we'll see you next week. But before we go, we have to say a handful of thank yous. Thank you, Jeremy Siegel, for our lovely theme music. We really appreciate it. You can find more of Jeremy's work at jeremysiegel42.bandcamp.com, where he is the only Jeremy Siegel who makes music. Fuck all the other ones. And on your favorite streaming (laughs) services as Nuclear Jaguar. And thank you to Angry Duck Time Machine on Instagram for our podcast artwork. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for editing the podcast and making the three of us this week sound coherent. Sorry you get a little bit of extra work for Ben, but frankly, that's my everyday life, so... (laughs) <laughs> I gave a thumbs up and you won't see that <laughs> I saw it I'll tell you about it 
And thank you to you, the listener, for being here with us. We appreciate you spending an hour just talking about one of our favorite episodes of Babylon 5. And if you want to talk more, you can visit us in the Discord or on Facebook. We have a blue sky that maybe Jafar will check because I don't know how to check it yet. I do. Uh, or you can email us. The Discord's a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah the Discord. If you need directions to the Discord, you can always send an email to whoareub5 at gmail.com. All right, we'll see you next week, Internet. Bye. Bye.